tools, the right tool for each job. That might sound a bit boring, but actually it's really fascinating discovering what you can do with your tools, how to use them most efficiently and effectively to do a great job and choosing the right tool each time, different kinds of tools. Like there's more than one type of shovel, for example, and a shovel's not the same as a spade. And trowels can be used in different ways. And how do you put plants in the ground? How do you level your beds? And so on and so on. So there's not a huge amount of jobs to do in the garden that need special tool or special skill, especially a no-dig garden like this. Most of it looks after itself, but I want to show you the best ways to use a few tools and the best ones to have and to look out for not only buying them or getting hold of them in the first place, but how to get the most from them. So maybe when you're gardening, traditional gardening, one of the first tools you might think of using would be a spade. <laughs> Actually with no dig, we don't use a spade much, but if you do use a spade and you can afford a spade like this, this is really good. It's, it's a lovely sharp blade. It's very useful for digging out bramble roots, for example, planting trees, that kind of thing. But in general gardening terms, a spade like this is, in, certainly in what I'm doing here, and I think for many of you, a shovel is more interesting. If you can compare a shovel and a spade, a spade is thinner, shovel's broader, shovel's more about literally shoveling up. And this is an unusual shovel perhaps for some of you because it's made of plastic. And I bought this shovel five years ago and I was not sure at the time, I thought plastic shovel, surely that's not gonna work. And can it be strong enough? And we've put it through a lot of shoveling. And by comparison, this would be a metal shovel, could be wider as well actually, but that's... What, one thing that's really interesting about these two shovels is, do you see the higher blade of this shovel, the metal one here? Just doesn't work so well. They've got the angle dead right on this one. And little things like that can make such a difference when you're shoveling up. You want it to be coming level to the ground, horizontal, underneath whatever you're shoveling and not digging in, that's important. And that's a real asset of a plastic shovel. It, because it doesn't bite into the soil, so I can be shoveling compost off the ground with this one and not digging into the soil underneath. And it makes it easy to get a nice clean finish. I don't want to leave any compost behind, but nor do I want to dig into the soil below. And this one, <laughs> I don't know where this one came from actually, someone left it here. And I use it occasionally if I can't find that one or whatever. Um, but I find when I'm using this one, because the angle is pushed up, it, it just doesn't go under and you have to be almost on top of what you're shoveling to get it to go in at the right angle. So that's just a very small example of the sort of ergonomics of shovels, if you like, but can make a big difference to how, how successful you are in using them. And another aspect about the plastic one, I kind of hate this, I'm extolling the virtues of plastic, but <laughs> there you go, it's very light. And if you're shoveling a lot of material for a long, you know, over a period of a day, say, or even a morning, that lightness reduces your workload quite a bit because every time you're moving stuff, there's less weight of the actual tool itself and the only weight is in the compost in this case. So moving compost is, as long as it's reasonably dry or not too soggy, is brilliant with a, shower, a, travel, a, a, a shovel. And that's what we use mainly for moving compost. So this is a four prong <laughs> manure fork with also a shorter handle. So it's not only the working bit of the tool, but it's the handle itself has quite a bearing and the way the angle handle set up, as we saw with the metal shovel there. This one's a nice fork and short handle means that you've got nice control of the end, but sometimes long handles are useful, like if you're reaching a bit further into a heap. And a pile like this, which is very bitty, this is wood chip mixed with grass, actually. We're, we're composting them together. It's getting quite warm there. But if I wanted to move this, which has a lot of fibrous woody bits in, I sh you can see how easily that fork goes in. You wouldn't get a shovel in there. You might get a spade in, but it would be a lot of unnecessary effort. So again, this is about apportioning your effort and doing it in the most sensible way. Yeah, you can see a nice bit of action going on there. And how easily this fork has, look at the size of that lump that's come out. It's quite light because there's quite a bit of grass in there. But I love working with forks actually when moving compost, turning or spreading it in the garden because there's so much less work than spades and shovels. And I do most of it with a fork. And you can use a fork also after you've 
say, spread a lump of compost. I mean, obviously, this isn't compost. But, you know, you can do that kind of thing to break up lumps of material. And we do that when spreading compost or manure. It's brilliant for lumps of manure. Do that and then shake it out like that. And that breaks up the lump as material gradually falls through these prongs. Hose come in many shapes and sizes and types. And you may never need to use a hoe. If you have a small garden, two or three beds, you probably don't need to. You can manage your weeds very easily by hand and occasionally using a trowel, that kind of thing. But it's, if you've got a bigger area and maybe <laughs> you spread some compost that has a lot of weed seeds, for example, so you get a lot of small weeds springing up, that's where a hoe can be really useful just to slide through the surface very shallow and when the weeds are very small. There's a nice old saying, you hoe your weeds before you see them. What that's getting at is how you need to be using a hoe when the weeds are so tiny that, yeah, they're hardly visible. <laughs> and, but they've got a root. They get a root before they get a leaf. And it's that root bit that needs disturbing and is most easily disturbed on a day like today, which is bright sun. And then you do that before two in the afternoon. And by evening, those little tiny weeds will die in situ. So a huge amount of work. You haven't got to remove them. And you can do hundreds with a few movements of the hand. And then in terms of hoe type, this is called a hoe. I still can't work it out, <laughs> but it would sort of go through the soil. For me, it disturbs the soil far too much. It's, I would use it if I was going to ridge up potatoes or something like that. that it's that kind of hoe. <laughs> but for normal weed hoeing, these are the type, the design I like, where you've just got a very thin blade that slides through. This is pretty typical metal material in the blade. And quite a nice handle, not quite long enough for me really. I'm bending down a bit while I'm using a hoe like that. And you can see how this blade has rusted a lot because it's iron. And that means it's gonna stick a bit in the soil and probably, unless it's bone dry, it'll gather up a bit of debris with it. In dry weather, it's fine, which is actually when you've mostly been using it. But for real ease of action and efficiency, I must say, these copper hoes are hard to beat. They are more expensive, I'm afraid, but it's similar principle, very thin blade, and these ones have a swivel too, so you've got a push-pull effect if you want to use that. You could do it just pulling. And I, I brought these two along, so I wanted to show you the difference. You can see the thickness of their blades. And the one with the thin blade is my old hoe. <laughs> used it about four years. And this one I bought just last year. So that's how much we've worn it down. I, I never sharpen these blades. They don't need it. They're self-regulating. Because it's copper light with a spade, it, it doesn't rust and it keeps smooth and shiny. So from the point of view user friendliness, they are just superb. And if I just demonstrate with this one, so if you find a spot where you, or anywhere in your garden, if you see a lot of little weed seedlings, usually early in the spring, all clustered there together, and then you run the hoe just shallow through them. You, with this one, you can go forwards as well, but forwards is not quite so easy. You've got better control while you're pulling the blade towards you. So, again, there are many ways of using it. Work out which one is best for you. Find the hoe that suits you best, and it won't necessarily be this one. There's other types of hoe called onion hoe and thinner blades, uh, thinner zone of action. So if you've got things planted really close together, you just want a very small blade to run between. Here, we actually use this very little because we're well on top of the weeds. But you, with weeds, you just need to react. So it's very good to have suitable tools that you might not use a lot, but when you need them, boy, it makes a difference to have good ones. So trowel, how much might you use a trowel? The two things we use it for mainly are removing perennial weed top roots, not the parent root, which is often deep down in the ground, but you can use a trowel just to go in almost vertical next to or close to the new growth you're seeing of say bindweed or cooch grass, whatever, and give it a little lever. And then you hear a clunk as the new root breaks off the deeper parent root and you can lever it out. It's a way of just getting more of the new root growth out, growth out which slows down regrowth of the new weed that is gonna grow. If you do that often enough, you can, you can get rid of bindweed through use of a trowel particularly. It's a weekly habit if you've got a lot of bindweed or cooch grass or mares tail commitment. <laughs> and the other thing 
we use them for quite a bit is planting. Uh, just before that, though, I just want to show you the difference. Uh, rather like the hose, new trowel and three-year-old, probably this one. It might be four, actually. It's starting to degrade a bit on the handle. Occasionally goes loose. You can see, I'm not, I can't be sure that all of that is worn away. I think this might have been a bit shorter anyway, but even something like this will slowly wear away a bit around the edge. Uh, having said that, because it's copper, it's keeping nice and smooth and shiny and usable. And that's a big factor in a trowel, that it can slide in easily. And with no dig, you don't want to disturb the ground too much. So, for example, we're planting a potato. I don't excavate a hole to put the potato seed in. I put the trowel in like this, pretty much as far as it'll go. So that's giving us, this is close to 15 centimetre, or sorry, not 10 centimetre, four inches. And give a little lever like that. And that means you can pull it towards you and then slip, slip this into the slit that you've made. It's more of a slit than a hole. And the seed potato going in with the sprouts upwards really helps. And it's now buried down there. And the, the potato's sort of there and we've got that much soil and compost on top. So I'm not going to earth these up actually. It's first early, they just stay like that. And then when it comes to harvest time, maybe late June, we just them out. If they were in for longer we'd drop a bit of compost on to earth them up. But that's one way of using a trowel to plant potatoes with minimal soil disturbance. And I can also illustrate a slightly different thing here with this. <laughs> this is a kale plant. It needs a bit of water, that's why it's wilted. But it's the offspring of the perennial kale there. You take a side shoot and put it in a pot of compost. That's all I did last summer and it then grows into its own plant. And so planting a pot plant like this, again, what I won't do is I won't be putting my trowel in and heaving up the soil. I want to, I make a square, I cut a square, roughly the shape of and size of the pot, slightly larger. Then you can take out like a plug of soil, compost, surface material. And then it's, the question is how deep to go and with pretty much anything you're putting in, you can go deep enough to bury most of the stem below the growing leaves. I mean, you, you could put this one in that deep, but actually I don't want to go that deep in the ground. And these plants, the kale plants, they have the strong, sturdy, sturdy stems. So it doesn't matter that they, they are a bit stemmy above the ground. A lot of vegetables we're planting, we actually do bury all the stem to make them really sturdy and strong. But now I've just made a hole of a nice size for that and it'll just drop in and I'm going to push it in and that ensures good contact but it, it's a fairly minimal soil disturbance and then you just fill in the surface like that push it in again and you've done your planting using the trowel and these copper trowels like I say they don't they don't rust and so that stays smooth and shiny it, you know it'll go in relatively easily without disturbing soil too much and the other thing about them is they've got a, a nice curve on them it's always a good sign and it's same with the spade I showed you. The curve makes the blade stronger and less inclined to snap because this is quite a soft metal. It's actually got 5% tin and that makes it a bit stronger. Um, it, I find if they're going to break anywhere it's, it's going to be splitting around the handle and then you might be able to buy a new handle. It's really nice with all these tools if you kind of you get friendly with them and you can get replacement parts like with the hoe I showed you you can buy replacement blades and attach them to the same handle so you haven't got to throw it all away <laughs> and um, that's also a lot cheaper. A rake. This is the type of rake that is most useful certainly when growing vegetables, small plants and main use is just getting a surface level after it's been disturbed for whatever reason. Maybe for example after harvesting potatoes or garlic and it's quite uneven because you pulled a few things out of the ground. I also do a bit of walking on, on the ground as well before using a rake just to get it more level and then using the rake in a very gentle horizontal motion. So raking is about not going deep in the ground. You're not moving large amounts of material from side to side. And in fact, <laughs> this, this piece of ground hardly needs raking because we did it a couple of weeks ago, quite a while before planting. It was quite uneven actually. It was after a, a green manure cover crop of mustard and now, yeah, it's pretty much ready. But if you had any unevenness 
it's good and also it's an opportunity after raking <laughs> especially here where i've used a bit of bought in compost there's some plastic and glass and all bits of things so i just pick them up and put them in my pocket <laughs> i don't want them in the ground for too long so it's kind of raking tidying leveling and that means that when you come to plant oh there's something else i've noticed here actually <laughs> in doing that there's quite a few little weed seeds there so since i haven't got my hoe here <laughs> i can use the rake just to scuff those little weed seedlings and i think they're a one-off usually when you see some there's often more but yeah no i'm not seeing much in the way of weeds so that's good so we've got clean ground now level ground we're ready to plant just a quick word on the rake again though this is the short prong type for this kind of work you don't want the long long prong rake which is good for raking up leaves and another lovely thing about this particular rake again is the handle it's nice and long so that means you've got you've got a wide sphere of working and especially if you're quite tall like me it's just just nice to use so if you get a chance before you buy tools like this or get hold of them you know just try using them and make sure that they're comfortable for you in, in this kind of way and actually another nice thing about handles that i mentioned is keeping them smooth and clean and occasionally we get people here who wear gloves and then their gloves get dirty with like wet soil or compost and then they use a tool and then forget to clean it when i come to pick up the handle i just hate that feeling of lumps of soil where my hands are it, i find it's really nice if you keep this soil free so this is clean and i old it about a year ago actually and haven't done it since so it's nice and smooth and shiny and just a pleasure to use that all tools should be like that a pleasure to use and i'm going to show you now one of my favorite tools so how to get these little plug plants in the ground with minimal disturbance and minimal effort and for these, I absolutely do not use a trowel. There's no need to whatsoever. A long handle dibber. I've got two here. It's really interesting because see how different they are. And which one would you prefer? If you saw these and maybe hadn't used a dibber before, well, how do you know? <laughs> well, I can tell you, this is the one I prefer, the fat one. And I think this is probably a more common perception of, of an easy to use dibber because it's making a smaller hole it would be easier to slide in but it's too small and pointy in my experience and then you, you end up with quite an, an air hole underneath it's difficult to get it quite fat enough it needs to be slightly larger than the size diameter of your actual module root ball and this is a prototype that was sent to me by the company i work with now garden imports to make my design of dibber <laughs> this is the first one they sent me and i said no <laughs> this won't work and so I, I took a photo of one i'd been using and i've used long handle dibbers that's what i call this long handle dibber uh, since 1983 i've used them always in my market gardening to plant i mean dibbers like this i must have planted close to a million plants i should think by now just making holes by hand it's quick simple easy the compost surface of a no dig bed is soft so we'll discard that one for now and i'll show you how i use this one the specifically just to make a hole of a suitable diameter to take two different kinds of plants you can see one of those plants is quite low to the ground that's the radish so i'm making a hole that's still deeper than the depth of the root ball of that radish but do you see how easily that goes in just a gentle pressure and it's not compacting any soil or making an, a, a, an unpleasant disturbance to the soil uh, just a small hole and then you can take your little clump in this case this is multi-sown radish it's a little bit early for planting these actually normally i'd wait a few days but you can plant at this stage and you're going to see how i do that and they just go in a little bit deep they're almost looking lost there but normally at this time of year we're putting fleece over the top so that protect the hole from getting filled in and smothering the leaves and they can nestle in there and it means less watering but if i'm planting something like this the way i use the dibber is slightly different well similar method if you like but just going deeper and sometimes if the soil is really dry you might want to do that bit or you can also do this to move the dry material from around the hole you're going to make and then you can make a hole without all the dry material falling in 
So there's little extra things like that. Um, the way you use all these tools, it, it takes a bit of practice and working in different conditions to work out how to get the most out of them. And then planting the fennel, it's totally fine that all of that stem is buried. So the soil level eventually can be at the top of my fingers. In it goes, just push it a little bit of soil or compost in there, but mainly it's pushing downwards to get contact between the root and the surface material of your bed. And that's it, we usually give a bit of water. But that, we normally leave the holes filled in. So when using these dibbers, it's actually very quick. You can just make, you sort of get your spacing organized first. You can go dib, dib, dib like this at this kind of speed. And before you know it, you've made a hundred holes and planted up half a bed or whatever it might be. Really, really great tool to use. And I'll finish with the smallest tool of all. Should we go and see what it is? This is my final offering of a really useful tool, a good knife, folding knife. I've nearly always got one in my pocket when I'm out in the garden. It's surprising how often you find you want it if you haven't got it. So it's a faithful companion. As, as a result of that, I've often lost them. Well, not often, occasionally. If I go flying, <laughs> I forget the knife is in my pocket and I enter security and I have to give it away. So this is an opinal knife. I've, I've tried quite a few over the years and they seem to have worked out better than anyone else how to make a metal for the blade that stays sharp for longer. That's why I like them particularly. And as long as I don't forget about it and throw it in the compost heat with a bucket of other stuff, <laughs> that happens as well, uh, it'll last for a very long time. I, the oldest one I ever had, actually, the blade had sort of gone to quite thin, rather like we saw um, with the hoe blade, because I'm sharpening it. So what you'll need careful with sharpening, is just a, this is just a standard stone. You can see I've also narrowed my stone by <laughs> using it quite a bit for, I use it in the kitchen knives and everything. Uh, just running it very lightly and shallowly along. My preference is to go on one side, the top side mainly, at around 25 degrees, but it's not precise. As long as you're comfortable with the angle, then you stick to it, and that way you won't wear away too much of the metal. So you're taking away enough of the metal just to make that reasonably sharp. And then, that's the main, this is my way of doing it, by the way. I'm not claiming this is the only way or the perfect way, but it works for me in, over many years. That, and you can feel that the, the stone is just grating a bit on the knife. So it's, it's pinching a bit of the metal, taking a bit off, just a bit. And then if you've got that nice, you'll feel on the other side, it's a little bit burred and you can just run very shallow, almost level with the blade there. And that brings you to a really keen, keen is a nice word. It's so sharp that if you did that, if I did that on my thumb, it'll cut it. But actually this is a way of testing. As long as your skin's quite tough, you can feel the sharpness as you go that way across, not that way. And there you go. So you've got a sharp knife in your pocket all the time. Stone like that, very simple, good investment. And I hope you've enjoyed having a look at ways of using some key tools. This is not designed to be the ultimate primer, but it's to give you some pointers and to help you get comfortable, feel comfortable with your tools. That's a really key thing. Find ones you like and then stick with them. You, they become like limbs that you can use <laughs> whenever you need them. And we'll put in the video description some more details about some of these, including where, where you can buy them, like the Dibber, for example, is now available in, in the North America. And yeah, enjoy your gardening with some nice tools.